Good afternoon. My name is Rashmi Dialchan, and I am a professor of law at Northeastern University. I want to welcome you to the second Brookline Townwide Forum on Housing Affordability. Thank you for joining us. I also want to thank the wonderfully diverse group of local organizations that have made this forum a reality. These include the Commission for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations, the Economic Development Advisory Board, the Housing Advisory Board, and the many participants from over 15 other local organizations who helped organize this forum. And we all owe a big thank you to the Brookline Interactive Group, and in particular, Anne Tice, for their superb technical support throughout this forum series. Our first townwide forum on housing took place on June 14. Our purpose in that forum was to set the stage for further conversations about housing affordability in Brookline by changing the conversation. Our speakers highlighted the ways that achieving racial equity, economic development, transportation access, and climate sustainability are all intertwined with the goal of housing affordability. To those of you who attended that forum, thank you and welcome back. And for those who didn't, here is a very brief description of the program. We began with a presentation by Bob Van Meter, who has served both as the executive director for the Local Initi Initiatives Support Corporation's Boston program, and as the executive director of the Alston Brighton Community Development Corporation. Bob framed our conversation about the need for housing affordability in Brookline by describing the history of racial discrimination in our town. He described the patterns of segregated housing development and of redlining that prevented African-American families and other families of color from accessing housing in Brookline. As he discussed, this history was the result of a set of conscious values-based choices. And we can now make different choices as we move into the future. Bob's presentation about the history of systemic racism in Brookline was followed by a presentation by Deborah Brown, who is a board member of the Brookline Improvement Coalition and a town meeting member. Deborah brought the discussion about racism and housing accessibility into the present. Although many of us abide by and indeed cherish the values of diversity and inclusion in our community today, Deborah articulated the disturbing gap between our aspirations and our current reality, one that is highlighted by the coronavirus pandemic and its inequitable impact on communities of color. She described the palpable effects of this gap on the communities who still today are marginalized from accessing housing in Brookline. Deborah defined an anti-racist as someone willing to act to dismantle institutional racism and the policies that entrench it. She described Brookline as having condoned racism through inaction, emphasizing that we can no longer be neutral. She concluded by asking us to question how Brookline is allocating its financial and other resources, saying we can do better. These presentations provided the context, the frame, for understanding the important work that lies ahead. Following the presentations, we heard from a panel of experts representing several different constituencies whose work is and must be related to the imperative of housing affordability in Brookline. Jennifer Raitt, who is a member of Brookline's Housing Advisory Board, began by discussing the housing production plan and the need for more housing options, including multifamily housing at multiple income levels. Jenny described the challenges of passing the necessary zoning changes, which require us to move beyond the state level statute, chapter 40B, in order to provide housing access to the missing middle, seniors, young families, and a range of vulnerable communities in order to achieve the mix of incomes and racial and ethnic diversity to which we aspire. She noted the need for anti-racist zoning that would allow multifamily mixed use zoning in commercial areas by right, and the need for a dedicated shift in what we are doing. Next, Chris Dempsey, who is the chair of Brookline's Transportation Board, 
discuss the crucial connections between housing affordability and transportation. Chris focused on the outdated parking minimums required of all new residential development, which significantly increased the cost of construction, resulting in a higher household cost for lower income residents and in a diminished tax base for the town. Chris provided compelling and achievable examples of multi-use, multi-family buildings along Brookline's transportation corridors and compared them to examples of precious land wasted for parking adjacent to some of our commercial buildings. He also gave us a roadmap, if you'll pardon the pun, for how to develop more such buildings in our town. Chris was followed by Al Rain, a national consultant on mass transit and transit-oriented development and a member of Brookline's Economic Development Advisory Board. Al discussed the synergistic relationship between multi-use economic development and multifamily housing and transportation. Businesses need workers and customers within walking distances and residents need convenient access to shops and services. This powerful combination not only creates a vibrant community, but also provides the density that drives effective use of scarce land. As Al described, mixed use is essential for housing affordability. And commercial developments have a significant role to play by providing jobs, local goods and services, vibrancy, and financial stability for the town. Finally, we heard from Werner Lowy, a town meeting member and co-chair of the Select Board's Climate Action Committee. Werner emphasized the relationship between the goals of housing affordability, accessible and affordable transportation, housing and business density, and climate sustainability. He noted the importance of moving to electrification of buildings to save construction dollars and operating costs. He also cautioned that the existing gas infrastructure is going to need extensive upgrading and that electrification would help prevent that cost burden from falling on low income residents. Now, turning to today's forum, our agenda for today is to take a deep dive and look at two success stories. We'll hear from two individuals who are involved in successful efforts to create long-term housing affordability in their communities. Each used different strategies and each provided a range of lessons from which we can learn. One noteworthy consistency between these stories and ours though, is the recognition among key constituencies that achieving their goals required working together. In this respect, and in a number of others, the stories that each of our speakers will tell resonate with Brookline's story. Our moderator in this part of the discussion is Wendell Joseph. Wendell is an urban planner with a passion and a desire to help facilitate the growth and well-being of cities and communities by providing thoughtful and practical solutions to complex urban and social issues. His past experience includes planning processes at citywide and neighborhood scales, parks and open space planning and projects, placemaking and engagement processes, and community needs and benefits. Wendell is currently at Sasaki, a 65-year-old award-winning interdisciplinary design and research firm located in Watertown, Massachusetts. The practice comprises the disciplines of architecture and interior design, urban planning and urban design, and landscape architecture and civil engineering, and spans campus, civil and cultural, and commercial client sectors, both national and international. For more information, you can certainly visit their website, www.sasaki.com. Wendell. Thank you very much, Rashmi. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you and to um, be part of today's um, discussion. Um, so, you know, why, why are we here? Well, you know, aside from the discussion around affordable housing, um, I just wanted to take a, a you know, quick second to kind of like set the stage or the framework for the importance of having this discussion. Um, for those of us who are, um, you know, planning practitioners in the planning profession, um, we know that planning is an exercise to really think about um, the future of our communities, the futures of our cities. Um, but more than that, it's, it's, it's trying to, you know, take a very good look at where we are now and where we came from, right? So it's, here's where we are now, here's where we're trying to go, how might we get there? 
And so in thinking about the how, I think it's important to really um, take a step back um, from time to time and, and, and engage or explore the range of possibilities, the range of strategies that we could look to mobilize in order to achieve that um, you know, desired future. And so that's why we're here today, right? To, as Rashmi mentioned, to, to learn from two different communities who are um, um, engaging in different strategies for their respective communities to facilitate uh, affordable housing or housing affordability in general. And we want to figure out, well, what, what can we learn from these case studies that can be of value to Brookline today? Um, so with that, um, I do want to take a quick second to address some quick housekeeping um, items before I pass it on to George. So you'll notice that the chat function has been disabled for the general audience. So we're asking that you please submit your questions through the Q&A box. Um, we've got some folks behind the scenes who are keeping their eyes on the box and uh, on the Q&A box and making sure that um, your questions um, are passed along to us. So we'll, we'll definitely try to uh, make sure that we address everybody's questions. Um, so the format will go as follows. Um, so I'll uh, introduce George in a second and George will um, um, share um, about the work that he's been doing at Somerville. Once George has finished with his um, portion, then we'll go into a, a Q&A um, um, in response to what George has talked about. And that will be about 15 minutes. And then I'll introduce Yane and Yane will um, share with us some stories um, from Minneapolis. And then we'll have uh, 15 minutes to um, engage in Q&A with her about her work. And then um, after our panelists have finished our presentations, we'll then um, um, move out to a larger panel discussion to um, wrap up today's discussion, in which case, um, you know, you all are more than welcome to participate as well and, and submit questions there. So again, so George will present first and then we'll do a Q&A around Somerville. Yanni will present second, we'll do a Q&A around Minneapolis and then we'll have a larger panel discussion um, at the end. So with that, um, I would like to introduce to you George Proakis, who is the Executive Director of the Office of Strategic Planning and Community Development in Somerville, Mass. George uh, currently facilitates impl implementation of the Summer Vision City Plan, which focuses on topics as varied as zoning, urban design, stormwater recharge, family housing, and backyard chickens. Very exciting. So with that, I'll pass it on to George. Uh, thank you, Wendell, and thank you all for having me here today. Um, I'm gonna give a little bit of a perspective on what we're doing in Somerville. Um, and I think that it's it's worth noting to start because um, uh, as, as, as we look at communities, we all have similarities and differences. And um, I'm hoping that despite the differences between Somerville and Brookline, some of the similarities will allow us to have a perspective where we can uh, compare notes and share some of the things that uh, may be relevant to the challenges that Brookline has today. Um, so I'm going to provide a little bit of an overview on Brookline and Somerville, some of the regional challenges, talk about three uh, projects we're working on in Somerville and how they all tie together um, in terms of looking at housing, housing affordability and housing opportunity in, in our region and, and in Brookline in particular. Um, our communities do indeed have a lot in common. Um, I think one of the more specific things we have in common in the very near future is when the Green Line extension is complete. Um, to Tufts University and hopefully someday from beyond it will it, it will link us directly on a single transit line, um, which also will bring 85% of Somerville from 15% uh, not long ago to 85% of Somerville being within a half mile walk of a rail station. Um, Somerville, four and a half square miles, a population of about 80,000. We know we hold the distinction of being the densest city in New England and are well known for our little neighborhood squares. Um, but probably you're best known for uh, having a, a pretty specific and consistent residential character. Um, one of the other challenges to Somerville is unlike our neighbor to the South Cambridge, which seems to have a lot of more commercial growth. Um, one of our challenges um, financially and fiscally has been that we have been dependent upon um, a residential character, single two and three family homes, which uh, requires us to both manage our tax base very carefully and uh, ensure that new growth meets both commercial and residential needs. Um, and, and helps us grow in a way that makes sense for our community. Um, but we have a lot in common, strong walkable neighborhoods, the green line, as I mentioned. We also have a series of corridors with high capacity bus lines. Uh, we're trying to make those buses faster and more efficient in Somerville all the time, um, but uh, they provide a substantial transit link 
Um, I think in many ways, our leadership, the strength of our municipal planning offices and our regional affordability challenges are also very, very similar. Um, within our region, um, Mayor Curtitoni, the mayor of Somerville and, and my boss has been uh, co-chairing the Metro Mayors Coalition, which is led by the regional planning agency, MAPC. Um, and they have been spending a substantial amount of time talking about regional housing needs. So the Metro Mayors Coalition includes the mayors and city managers and town managers of the 15 communities closest into the Boston inner core, um, including Brookline, um, all connected by transit um, and have focused on this issue that sale prices and rents are amongst the highest of any large metropolitan area in the country. And I won't focus on every word here. I'll merely focus on the idea that, that since 2010, the 15 cities and towns have added 110,000 residents, 148,000 jobs, and only 32,500 housing units. Um, the Metro Mayors Coalition and MAPC see a need to add 185,000 housing units between 2015 and 2030 to meet demand and reduce or at least stabilize housing costs. A very significant challenge, um, but one that we can work on best all together. Um, and I uh, know that all of our communities are talking about these issues and, and working collaboratively on how to address them is something that, that, that can be very helpful. Um, I wanna share three strategies we've been using in Somerville. Summer Vision, our comprehensive plan, Somerville by Design, which is our neighborhood and corridor plans and our zoning work. Um, Summer Vision is the citywide comprehensive plan, which we are actually now completing an update on Early, earlier in my career in Somerville, about 10 years ago, we worked on creating the first citywide comprehensive plan. And I don't think you necessarily need to focus completely on comprehensive planning as a uh, strategy to be able to uh, um, necessarily address um, all of your challenges regarding housing. But one of the advantages around comprehensive planning and any planning strategy is the opportunity to bring the community together, to have a conversation about where things are going, um, to look at both the physical design and, and the opportunities throughout the community. Um, and there are people, by the way, who are now doing these planning efforts as, as remote although it is still more interesting to get everybody around table and try to address these problems. But the key issue is to address how to achieve our community's values. And in Somerville, we spent a lot of time on this value statement. And even as we've gone into updating our plan, the values have remained essentially the same, but celebrating diversity, fostering community, investing in an economic base, promoting accessibility, building a sustainable future and committing to innovation. Um, and staying focused on those values has allowed us to be able to achieve goals um, as we address housing that make sure that we remain focused where we need to be. We also put together a set of pretty aggressive numbers on where we want to be, including um, developing 6,000 new housing units over 20 years, um, including 20% of those being permanently affordable. And, 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 and we're meeting or exceeding those goals, but it's also balanced around job goals and open space goals and transit goals. Um, and a map that clarifies where and how we want to do this. In our neighborhoods, the green area, we're mainly conserving the character of those neighborhoods. We are focused on the idea that within those areas, we will have more um, maybe accessory dwelling units or additional units, but not substantial change to its character. Uh, in, the, in those sort of yellow orange areas, which are old industrial areas, you can do substantial, really intense development. Um, but where I want to focus my energy today really is in the blue areas, the corridors, the squares, the T-stations, the areas that have a lot of consistency to the character um, that we see in many areas of the community in Brookline. Um, and as Summer Vision passed, we had the opportunity to look at some very subtle strategies to try to move projects forward. Um, you know, replacing parking lots and automobile-oriented places with with new development, missing middle housing. Um, these are three and six unit development projects. Um, these are two more that are six units with retail below. Uh, this one being a little bigger, uh, the old Boys and Girls Club that was vacant. Um, the lot beyond, which definitely had a green space in the front that, that a lot of people were not too happy about losing. But as we balanced it out, the building in front closest to us is all affordable housing built by our Community Development Corporation. The one behind it is market rate condos with affordable condos included um, with retail. And we were able to, these areas near transit stations, we were able to build three, four, five story buildings and get some new development. 
Um, this was another one that was kind of, this building had a lot of challenges and issues in our Winter Hill neighborhood. Um, I don't necessarily think the replacement building is going to win any design awards, but nonetheless, um, it brought 45 housing units, first floor retail, um, some new opportunities in the community, um, some substantial debate about how to do new development, but nonetheless um, allowed us to, with, with smaller efforts, uh, you know, not not high rises, be able to change the character of our neighborhoods a little bit consistent with those summer vision values. Um, in specific neighborhoods, we went into doing neighborhood planning. I want to share three of those really, really short, quickly with you. Uh, and on these, we really focused on the idea that we were moving away from the old style of planning where we were kind of planning out our strategy in the office, sharing it with the community, and then having everybody complain about it. But I call it decide, announce, defend replacing it with a process where we worked from the ground up with the community on outreach and dialogue and deciding together and implementing the plan. Um, we did these for neighborhood plan areas. We brought people together in the community, um, did a lot of design and drawing work to try to figure out what we wanted to do. Um, met, come, we've come up with a number of these little station area plans for neighborhoods around future Green Line stations, Lowell Street being uh, near Magoon Square, Kind of a very subtle little plan to take industrial buildings and turn them in, or turn them into or replace them they were kind of older out of out of beyond their useful life and figure out what to do we did one little plan here where we were going to replace just a couple of buildings uh, and this has worked remarkably well this this, this development where area has has developed almost exactly according to plan essentially three-story buildings um, little commercial in one spot, mainly residential. Developer came in and built almost exactly what we drew in the, in, in the neighborhood plan, and it's been very well supported. Um, Winter Hill, which is the neighborhood where we had this building, we uh, also have a vacant star market site nearby. I've had a lot of discussion with the community about how to build that out to include green space and development um, and, and address parking needs. We've put together a plan. We have not yet had something happen there, but um, we have community support and a community group that's advocating to try to get that plan done. Gilman Square, probably one of our most interesting outcomes. This was one of our earliest plans and we actually planned a four story character neighborhood with essentially five development sites right around a transit station. And really something that we thought at four stories was the right mix. Um, we've got this one gas station site, which is right in the middle of the community. But what's happened since then is a group of neighbors has actually formed and has actually been advocating for more development. They want the development up on the T station to be taller so they can get more green space. And they wanted the development at the gas station. The developer came in with a six story building. The neighborhood group actually became supportive of it. And for the first time that I've ever seen in my time working in planning, which is about 18 years at this point, we actually had a neighborhood group on their own file a request to upzone a neighborhood from four stories to six because they actually wanted more development there. Um, so we're now moving forward to get that work done. Zoning is a key to, to, to success in a lot of ways. And I think sometimes, you know, people look at zoning. I, I like to say the two scariest words for town meeting sometimes are change and zoning, and you put the two of them together, and sometimes people shy away from trying. But I think that it is worthwhile to take those two things and bring them together when we did summer vision. And I think you'll see this when you do housing planning as well. You may find that a lot of your goals relate to issues that can be solved through zoning. Um, so we spent many years working on a zoning overhaul. I, again, I won't necessarily say communities need to replace their entire code, uh, but it worked well for us in Somerville past this past December um, and built neighborhood um, zoning districts based upon the character of the community. So we have, a, we have a neighborhood residence district, which is our two and three family house district, pretty typical for Somerville. But we also have an urban residence district, which is designed for those missing middle housing types, the four plexes, the six plexes, the small apartment buildings, um, and then various mid-rise districts that allow for commercial or residential or first floor retail or other different housing types, that being a three-story district, this being a four-story district, um, and for each of those sort of very clear, delineated, uh, basically a form-based strategy for building types to establish. So this is how to build a four-story building that can be mixed use with first floor retail and all of the provisions that go with it. Um, a simplified uh, use table. Um, I wish a few more of our residential household living categories were by right and not special permit, but you know, you make, you, you, you make baby steps as you go. And then the beauty of doing new zoning was the capacity to be able to layer into offering, as you offer new capacity to build, you can offer opportunity to um, add to the, um, 
the, the requests and the things you want from development to produce in order to meet your values and meet your goals. So 20% inclusionary affordable housing, a mobility management strategy that is based more on managing parking rather than requiring parking. So wanting to get people out of their cars, have our commercial activities, try to encourage more walk, bike, transit trips to work every day, um, this whole mobility management strategy to promote the use of other forms of travel are more important than parking requirements that we reduced or eliminated in most of our districts. Um, this green score concept, which basically ensures that the quality of our landscape is high, um, sustainable development strategies about green buildings and green roofs and heat islands and environmental performance that we intertwined with the code where basically if you, if you uh, are seeking more development, you're going to do it, but you're going to do it in consistency, do it in a way that is consistent with our community values coming from summer vision. So I think the key here is that it's been over a decade that we have worked in, in, in Mayor Carter Tony's administration to bring elected officials, municipal staff, the development community, and a lot of organizations and advocates together to try to find common ground. Um, the idea of, of conserving some areas and transforming others in the community, the idea of um, focusing on achieving housing goals while also achieving environmental goals together and using zoning to do that have, have, have been done by converging community groups and having those conversations. Um, the outcome of these community planning strategies have been that our neighborhood nodes and corridors can be developed in line with community needs. We can meet that missing middle. You know, we're doing the high rises in places like Assembly Square, but it's, but it's most interesting and challenging in those neighborhoods where you're trying to do those three, four, five story buildings, and we're finding ways to get that done. Um, we're meeting regional needs, we're balancing mixed uses. Um, I think one of the most significant outcomes of all of our planning efforts is when we dropped ourselves into a pretty significant recession this year. Um, we found ourselves also in a year where we were getting $10 million of new tax growth in the community that balanced the loss of a lot of our meals and hotel tax and put us in a position where we made it through this budget year without furloughs or layoffs because of the way we've been able to position that new growth. And then we're still focused on sustainability and climate benefits uh, certainly in some ways keeping an eye on what you all were doing uh, uh, with, with, with the uh, efforts surrounding sustainability and new construction and um, trying to figure out ways that we can we can do things in both zoning and, and other regulations to try to make sustainability a part of what we do. I think the key for us on the zoning front is that up zoning plus value capture, capturing some of the value of that increase in zoning allows us to achieve both new housing and benefits to the community. And I think that's the significant opportunity that we had, those benefits being making sure we have more affordability, uh, making sure we have more opportunity, uh, making sure we have more sustainability. Um, and a lot of people call that value capture, capture the cash, get it in the form of linkage, get it in the form of affordable housing. Um, but I wanna change that title a little bit from value capture to, 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 to values capture, that we're actually capturing our values themselves. Um, that, that that sustainability and that diversity are actually part of the values of what we're trying to achieve. The zoning overhaul is a new operating system. It's a new structure of how to do things, but it remains a work in progress and we've already proposed amendments to it. And I, don't, I think with zoning, you're never really done, but you have the opportunity to capture and connect to your community values in a way that can make things happen. Now I have an advantage in Somerville and I just wanna point this one thing out as, as, as I complete my introduction here. Um, and one of those advantages is I have an 11 member council, which means in order to change vote zoning, I need a total of eight votes. Certainly in a town meeting community, it can be a little bit more difficult. You have to pull a much larger group of people together in order to make those sort of changes. Um, one of the things a number of us have been focusing on is the discussion in the legislature about the governor's housing choice bill, which would lower the threshold for zoning changes that bring new housing together from two thirds to one half. Um, even in an 11 member council, that changes my vote count from eight to six, which is huge. In a town meeting community, it makes it even more possible to talk about building programs that allow more housing and allow it to happen in a way that also achieves community values. So it's something that I've been, and our mayor has been focused on and, and, and it's been a topic of conversation as a way to make it a little bit easier to achieve some of the goals we're trying to achieve. Um, so that's the basic introduction of what I have to share today. Um, and uh, Wendell, I'm here to answer questions and happy, happy, to, uh, happy to be here again and uh, happy to answer your questions, thanks. 
Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, George, for sharing us um, a bit of what Somerville has been up to for the past uh, 10 years. I think one of the things that stands out is how um, it's, it sounds like you guys have been tackling uh, these issues from a number of different um, fronts. You mentioned um, the zoning piece, you mentioned, um, you know, looking at uh, just uh, things at a neighborhood level. You even mentioned the um, you know, the decision making and decision makers that are involved in that process and having the kind of folks on board who um, are open to certain ideas, who are open to certain conversations and support, um, you know, what you call this, you know, a values kind of driven um, planning process. Um, just a, a quick question I'd like to ask before I, um, um, you know, switch to a question from the audience is, um, I liked how you talked about uh, the old way of planning versus what you guys are trying to do through Somerville Design. Um, and it's interesting because one of the things I've, I've thought a lot about and have mentioned is, um, you know, if you want to do something different, you have to do it differently, right? I mean, I think one of the things that's frustrating is, is seeing, you know, folks trying to do something new, but then still keeping to like the same tools or strategies or processes that we've become accustomed to. But it seems like you guys realize that, hey, you know, we might need to shift our approach a little bit and engage in a kind of planning process that you know one may call you know grassroots or community driven, um, and and so I'm I'm just curious if I guess my qu my question then is were there some things that came up through those processes that you were not expecting, um, things that um, you learned that um, you know you guys did not necessarily plan for and that may have changed how the discussion happened or what the outcome was. So basically, was did anything happen that you were not expecting? Um, I mean, there are a few things that have happened that I'd say I was not expecting. Um, one perspective is that as, as we did the smaller neighborhood plans, um, it, it, it was interesting to see that it community members that stepped up had still had very different opinions on where we wanted to be in terms of building height and character and stuff. And um, that has evolved somewhat in Somerville over the course of the last couple of years. And um, since we finished some of those plans, we have found that uh, more and more people have been advocating for us to do more than we actually put in the plan. That was completely unexpected. Um, one of our largest plans, Union Square, I think had the most unexpected things happen because um, our Community Development Corporation organized um, a group of advocates that really pushed us on community benefits. Um, and uh, if you look at now, Union Square is a more dense development. It, there are high rises in that development. It's bigger than the examples I provided today. Um, but that plan document is bigger than the ones I show. The, the, the little ones I was describing today are, are 20, 30 page documents. They're, they're very small, very focused on design. Um, the Union Square plan has a 50 page introduction to it about equity. Um, and we did not set out to do that in our planning effort. We did that because the community came to us and demanded that, okay, well, we're okay with you doing more here, um, but we wanna make sure that our small businesses are protected. We wanna make sure that we address issues of uh, um, how we're gonna do affordable housing in these circumstances above and beyond the, the, the inclusionary. So uh, we spent a lot of time working on on that and, and that, that shifted our, our plan efforts significantly. Our, our Somerville by design still leads from design, but it, it, it has much more of an equity component in it in our most recent plans than in our earliest ones because of that community conversation that has happened and changed over time. So that's great. I mean, I think it's great that, yeah, things happen that you were not expecting, but that the city um, in the process was able to respond to what the community um, was advocating for. So that's great. Um, so let me uh, jump to some questions from, from our audience. So the first is, what are Somerville's goals for low income family housing? So it, when we did the 2010 Summer Vision Plan, the goal was to make sure that 20% that, um, of the units we were building were affordable. Um, as time went on, we actually, in 2016, we shifted ourselves to a 20% inclusionary requirement, um, which means that, 20, that in new development, 20% uh, of those units are, are, are affordable at different tiers, depending upon a formula. Um, we do do them on site. We've, we've only once in the last 15 years taken cash instead of the on site units. Um, but our actual goal now is moving beyond that 20% because, in addition to our efforts on in inclusionary housing, we do have purpose built affordable housing by community development corporations and other organizations, which pushes our numbers up higher than 20. 
um, as we look to re-up our master planning efforts, um, one of the things we're trying to do is actually measure um, how much of our community is in a housing distress situation, is, is putting 40, 50% of their income into paying for housing costs. Um, and what we would have to do in terms of housing affordability to meet their needs actually pushes us to the idea that our new construction goals should be should be um, higher based upon having more new construction affordable housing. But it also focuses us on a different effort that we've been pull, pushing through for the last couple of years, um, which is actually buying existing housing units in the community um, and building a scattered site basis of affordable housing um, with existing units. It, our money goes farther that way. Um, our program, which we call 100 Homes, the goal is to buy 100 homes in the community and uh, preserve them as permanently affordable. In some cases, um, we bought triple deckers, six plexes, um, 10 unit apartment buildings um, that were at the verge of being sold to somebody who is going to, uh, you know, upgrade the units and resell them as, as a much higher cost form of housing. We've been able to stabilize tenants in those circumstances. So those two programs together, building new housing and stabilizing what we have, um, you know, I mean, if, if if you do the numbers theoretically, we should we should end up with 35% of our housing stock in some form of affordability in order to in order to preserve our community in terms of diversity and 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 affordability. It's very tough to get to that number, and I think we're just picking away at it the best we can. Yeah, that's great. I mean, and I think it's a great segue to our our next question from David Rockwell. Uh, this is a great presentation of possibilities from planning and zoning for multifamily. Uh, Dave's aware of the 100 Homes Initiative in Somerville, which has captured about 96, per, uh, 96 units for long-term affordability off the private market from single family uh, to 12 unit buildings on the market that would have otherwise gone to developers without an potentially without an interest in affordable housing. So Dave's question is, do you think it's an additional model program for a place like Brookline? So I guess Dave's question is, could, you know, what are your thoughts on something like this happening in Brookline? So, uh, what what you need to do it, um, what we needed to do it anyway, is the Community Preservation Act, and we take a lot of our Community Preservation Act uh, housing money and put it towards this program, um, an affordable housing trust fund that's collecting uh, either linkage fees from commercial development, or uh, they also catch the proportional fees. So if, if you have to do 10.6 affordable units, the 10 you do on site, the 0.6 goes into the trust and, the, and that builds opportunity for the trust or uh, 49 of those units were getting through taking a payment in lieu of on-site units. I, I managed to trade in a deal 30, 33, 30, 32 on-site units for enough money to buy 49 off-site units. That was a very controversial deal that we put together, um, but it is creating a lot of units in the 100 homes program. I do think if you have that sort of funding capacity available. I mean, I think the other thing that would help, which Somerville's been advocating for, and um, I believe Brookline's advocated for as well as a home rule, is um, uh, the, the discussions happening at the state house about a real estate transfer fee to pay for affordable housing. Um, we feel if we had the transfer fee, we could substantially ramp up the 100 homes program even more. We tend not to buy out units that could be developed for more intensity. Like, like if, if if there's a two family house and, and, and a huge parking lot sitting on a site that could handle 45 units, it's probably not our, our target for a hundred homes project. Uh, you know, but if there's a sixplex in the middle of a neighborhood that someone's just going to gut flip upgrade and turn into million dollar condos and, and we know that we can preserve that for, for existing residences or future residents, that, that's a good target for us. And, and I think it's a good program for a lot of communities. Right. So, so I think this is another good segue. I feel like you're, you're guessing this question is in advance, George. So uh, at the top of your answer, you mentioned uh, linkage fees or linkages. Um, so we have a question here about that. Um, uh, how long has Somerville had a linkage program and how has it impacted commercial development, if at all? Um, Somerville, uh, let's see, I believe it was since the mid 1990s that Somerville had a linkage program. Um, so we collect so when you build a commercial building in Somerville, the first 30,000 square feet, we don't collect any funds. Beyond 30,000, based upon our linkage nexus study, we have a calculation of what kind of demand for affordable housing is created by new commercial development in our area. Um, and we collect a per square foot fee that's paid over the course of, at this point, I think it's three years. It used to be five years. Um, and that fee is now up, up around $10. Um, we've just about doubled it since I started working in Somerville. Um, 
we haven't seen a significant negative impact on commercial development. I do worry that there is a number you will hit, which will cause that to happen. Somerville and Brookline may find themselves in a similar, similar position. Somerville is in an interesting place. You know, Cambridge and Boston have a built-in demand for, for commercial development that they can ask top dollar for a lot of things and it won't necessarily scare commercial development away. Um, we have to look very carefully at that balance in Somerville because on one hand, I can look to Cambridge and say, well, if our fees lower than Cambridge or lower than wealth, lower than Boston, we're still, we're, we're, we're still competitive. But if somebody's comparing us to Waltham or Andover where they have no fee at all, um, we're not as competitive because of, of the fees and the things we ask for. That said, we've upzoned a lot. We've allowed a lot of possibilities for new commercial development. Um, Puma's North American headquarters is moving to Assembly Square. They're, that building is paying those linkage fees. Um, so generally, our perspective has been, um, you know, we want people to come to our community who want to build and want to do things, but we also want them to do things that are consistent with our values and paying into that linkage fee and helping us with affordable housing is consistent with our values. So far, I haven't seen a sign that our linkage fees have reached a point where we're scaring commercial development away from Somerville. Thank you very much, George. So I have one more question for you before we uh, switch to Yana. Um, how did Somerville assess their infrastructure and service capacity to add additional residents? Did the Green Line extension trigger the look at zoning? Could you describe the length of time and number of consultants used to craft a renewed zoning bylaw that achieves desired outcomes? So it's like three questions in one. So the zoning effort for us, the overhaul was a seven year project, which I would not recommend anyone spending seven years <laughs> doing, but it was a seven year project. Um, we took a general strategy that in the areas where we had done neighborhood plans, the new zoning reflects the neighborhood planning. And essentially, a lot of the conversation around infrastructure occurred at the neighborhood plan level, so that by the time we got to the zoning, we were comfortable with where we were going. Um, so, like, for example, in Union Square, um, we put together the Union Square neighborhood plan, which included consultants studying the, um, the infrastructure there. Um, and at Union Square, in order to actually achieve our zoning goal, we actually have had to do a tax increment financing, what Massachusetts, they call a DIF district, um, to capture growth off of the new development tax growth and put it towards sewer upgrades and water upgrades and street upgrades in order to make that development capacity work. But that's in a place where we're building 10, 20 story towers. Um, in the neighborhoods where we're building four or five story buildings, um, we haven't seen the on-site need. Um, we do collect a fee for inflow and infiltration for, um, for sewer infrastructure um, that each building helps us upgrade and improve our sewer infrastructure. But we didn't feel that there was a need for extensive, substantial infrastructure improvement to do those corridor projects. Um, now, as far as future, the, the zoning is a very interesting situation in this circumstance where we have future overlay districts kind of ready to be built into the code in places that we haven't completely addressed yet, like Interbelt and Brick Bottom, which are neighborhoods that are mainly industrial, that we haven't completed all our neighborhood planning work, um, and, and that someday we'll have a district that will allow more intensity of development. We're going to go back. We're going to do neighborhood planning work in that neighborhood. We're going to answer the questions about infrastructure in that neighborhood plan, determine again whether we need another one of those tax increment districts or whether we can pay for upgrades on our own and balance whether or not that's worthwhile to do that level of development. And then if it is, then we do the tax increment district and the zoning overhaul together, um, the, 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 the zoning overlay, the additional district. Um, like I said, the, the new zoning code's an operating system. It's, it, 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 you can plug programs into it. It's like, it's like re built building a, a new system for your computer, but then you can plug different apps in over time. Um, as you know, they're ready to go. So at Union Square, where we had the infrastructure data and we had done the work, um, and there, you know, it's, it was a relatively um, collaborative project because we had a developer working with us who was willing to uh, cover the cost of doing that planning work. Um, uh, we were able to then plug that in and move forward. Um, so, the, so, you know, when you look at the cost of doing planning work, the neighborhood plans were, um, most of them were done with in-house staff and on-call consultants under $100,000 a piece, relatively straightforward little projects. The Union Square plan was more like $300,000 of work, which was developer paid for because we had a developer partner working with us. Um, 
we're going to probably spend more of our own money to do the plans in inner belt and, and brick bottom, the neighborhoods, the next, the next industrial neighborhoods. Those are the big transform neighborhoods. Um, but again, on the, on the, on the little, on the corridor sites like Lowell street and winter Hill, we've done them in house. We've done with a couple of consultants that can draw, we've done them relatively low cost. Um, and we feel pretty confident that our baseline infrastructure can handle replacing a two story building with a five story building, for example, in those circumstances and adding 45, 100, 150 new housing units in those circumstances. So that helps. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, appreciate your insight. Um, thank you so much. Um, we'll uh, take a, a, a moment now to switch over to the city of Minneapolis. Um, and so it's my pleasure to introduce to you all uh, Yanni Flizrin, who uh, has a special pa passion for the city of Minneapolis and how cities, how the cities we build shape people's lives and daily choices. Uh, Yannick co-founded Neighbors for More Neighbors, the group that led the grassroots support of Minneapolis, uh, Minneapolis's nationally acclaimed comprehensive plan that was passed in 2018. Previously, Yanni led the statewide affordable housing initiative that changed policy to ensure that all subsidized homes meet healthy and green standards. Yanni, thank you so much. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, I am going to share my slides. Can someone confirm that I'm sharing the title slide? You got it. Looks good. Confirmed. Fantastic. Well, thank you to Building a Better Brookline for the opportunity to share our Neighbors for More Neighbors story. Um, we at Neighbors for More Neighbors start with housing as a human right, and we don't have enough homes. And so if we care about people, we need to build enough homes that everyone can find one. We need them at every level so people who can afford more expensive homes aren't crowding out lower wealth people from our communities. And in progressive cities like mine and like yours, history shows that we've designed our policies to keep people out. And so while today we say we want a different result, those policies are still in place. Now, we also need complete neighborhoods that have all of the pieces that a healthy community needs. Uh, that's a balance of a variety of housing, green spaces, and businesses that create a human scale economy where people can flourish. Um, incomplete neighborhoods, places that lack shops and cafes and walkable streets, they leave us isolated and they take dollars out of our community. As the climate continues to change, complete neighborhoods allow us to be better stewards of our resources and create a brighter future for the kids that we love. Now, I am here today because I'm an advocate, one of the co-founders and organizers who volunteers too many hours with Neighbors for More Neighbors. Um, I've also been an affordable housing professional for 20 years. And in my experience, the hard part is not what to do, but the politics of how to get it done. So in Minneapolis, I worked with a big crew of volunteers to change the rules so that we can skip the expensive, time-consuming housing supply blocking battles and just get permission to build more homes. So we focus on ending exclusionary policies that allow wealthier, whiter neighborhoods to avoid making space for more neighbors. I'm here because we are part of that how. In Minneapolis, we dove into those messy politics and together with our allies, we did a thing. So Minneapolis has legalized small apartments anywhere in our city through our comprehensive plan, which is called Minneapolis 2040. It's a 20 year commitment, a work plan for every policy and action that the city of Minneapolis will touch. It's transportation, economic development, housing, climate, racial justice, and much more. So I'm gonna tell you the story of how. You face the same and honestly much more extreme housing shortage that we face. And as you listen, I challenge each and every one of you to identify one way that you can help propel change there. So to do this change, we had to make two things that are invisible, visible. We had to uh, daylight our racist history and the remaining impacts from that history. And we had to highlight that there's political will to create a different future. So what about that history and what does it mean today? White Americans generally, and white Minneapolitans in particular, don't know our racist segregationist history. 
So that's where a particular project, Mapping Prejudice, based at the University of Minnesota, where that comes in. They engaged about 3,000 volunteers. And Minneapolis liberals, we know how to volunteer. Uh, we all combed through about 180,000 historic documents uncovering the history of how Minneapolis became segregated. Those volunteers were searching for racial covenants, and we found about 30,000. Now, thinking about that history, 110 years ago, Minneapolis was not segregated. That ugly part of our story starts after an African-American couple, Madison and Amy Jackson, bought a house in a neighborhood called Prospect Park. Soon after, they helped their friend, William H. Simpson, who was also African-American, build a house nearby. This was in 1909, and a crowd of more than 100 showed up to protest their new neighbors in a conflict that the local paper headlined, A Race War in Prospect Park. In Minneapolis, the first racially restrictive deed appeared one year later in 1910. The deed in that transaction contained what would become a common restriction. It said that the premises shall not at any time be conveyed, mortgaged, or leased to any person or persons of Chinese, Japanese, Moorish, Turkish, Negro, Mongolian, or African blood or descent. Covenants created demographic patterns that remain in Minneapolis today. Residential segregation reinforces all the other disparities in employment, education, health, and much more. Mapping Prejudice created this slide, uh, or this map, it's animated on their website, that shows how these deeds sprouted up and spread across the city and the county. Their workshops also point out how, after the Minnesota State Legislature prohibited their use in 1953, the city of Minneapolis stepped in with exclusionary zoning for wealthy white neighborhoods. That zoning is largely in place today. Images like this map and being an active part of the research process has prompted many white Minneapolitans to reflect on how while we didn't create the system, we seem to benefit from the system. But you do have to make this invisible history visible. People don't know about racially restrictive deeds or that zoning and single family zoning in particular is systematically exclusionary until you connect the dots. In the last few years, several groups unhid the reality of what Minneapolis renters face. I'm going to highlight Inquilinos Unidos por Justicia, or IX. They organize some of the most vulnerable tenants in our city, often immigrants with or without papers and very low incomes. On the left, Vanessa del Campo Chacon told her story to MinPost. Once a teacher pointed out to her that her daughter never crawled, and Vanessa realized it was because she felt anxious about leaving her on the floor because of the mice and insects. On the right, Timothy Brown told his story to Shelter Force. He said, my house isn't weatherproofed for the winter, which is unbearably cold in Minneapolis. Last year, I lived through the entire winter without heat because my landlord refuses to fix the house and the heating system. Stories like these made tenants' rights and affordable housing a central theme in our 2017 city elections. Housing stable renters and people with fixed rate mortgages we are insulated from what most low-income renters face. Without IX telling these stories, most Minneapolitans can't imagine what our neighbors face. Now, in Minneapolis, we are constantly fed um, the story of our exceptionalism. We're near the top in all the lists. We have the best park system, the best biking city. We're also at the top of the list of cities with the biggest racial disparities. So in one example, four in five white families owns their homes, but only one in four black families do. In the Minneapolis 2040 draft, planners connected the dots of how historic segregation created racial housing disparities today. They used a racial disparity frame for every topic in the plan, but I'm here to share and to talk about our abundant housing plan um, today, so I'm going to focus on that. But I want you to know it didn't stop with housing. It is in every single part of the plan. 
they identified our city's planners, how every neighborhood in the city has a role to play in dismantling those systems. Now, this was the first time we ever called on the most exclusive parts of Minneapolis to be part of the solution beyond paying taxes. This plan was a step toward dismantling exclusionary zoning. The call to action in the 2040 draft primed the engagement process to make something else that is typically invisible, visible. A crew of people came out to defend single family zoned neighborhoods. They distributed apocalyptic red signs like this one. A couple of local social media celebrities applied their humor and skill to letting people know what was happening. Wedge Live is by John Edwards, and he offered well-researched tweets and blogs about anti-2040 organizing all year. One highlight was reporting that the anti-bulldozing legal battle was run by a guy who bulldozed his own house to build a bigger house. Ryan Johnson, our other local hero, he organized volunteers who biked every single block of the city of Minneapolis to locate those red don't bulldoze our neighborhood signs. Then he mapped the signs along with property value data. On the left, the map is the redlining map with where the signs are. And on the right, you see the property values with where the red signs were. His headline read, high property wealth and home ownership is the connecting thread among those strongly opposed to the Minneapolis 2040 comprehensive plan. It's no coincidence that John and Ryan are the same two people who came up with the name Neighbors More Neighbors. Now, spotlighting our history and the exclusionary impact of our history and the structural racism that maintains white wealth, that's one step. And while it sets us up for success, it doesn't dismantle exclusionary zoning policies or eliminate racial disparities. In the US, land use is locally controlled and it's political. So to legalize building abundant homes, we have to make the political support for change visible too. We need elected officials, residents, and municipal staff to play their part if we want to end policies that harm people and create a different future. We've built the political will to do that in Minneapolis, but we had to do our work to make that visible too. So how do we do that? First, city staff are deeply committed to ending racial disparities. And that's why the planning staff set up the conversation by naming a problem with civic engagement. Historically, people of color and indigenous communities, renters, and people from low income backgrounds have been underrepresented in civic processes. Then those planners designed to counteract that. They started their engagement by centering the voices of those underrepresented folks. They hosted safer spaces like invitation only Somali uh, focus groups for Somali entrepreneurs and others. The themes from those groups framed up the larger plan before they hosted open public events. At the open events, they reminded us of our values. They told us the challenges we face and they invited our ideas. They created a community process that was more like the state fair than a yelling match. So there was mobile friendly commenting and fun artist designed activities, including uh, a set in the future game show about trivia about Minneapolis in 2040. Those activities, those events always had free food. They invited everyone in Minneapolis to show up and we did. Now we had to do our part too. And this is where Neighbors for More Neighbors came in. There is widespread support for welcoming more people in Minneapolis. We made it our job to turn them out. The support in our city is more of a like, yeah, sure, of course we want to have enough homes to go around, than a, I totally want to show up and testify to the city council at city hall kind of support. Supporters are often people whose voices are, are missing. They're young people, transplants, renters. We had to let people know why it was important to show up that their voice mattered. And I will say the bulldozer sign people were kind of helpful here uh, and where and when and how to show up. We organized walk-in talks with our city council members. We hosted comment in a box parties. We wrote blog posts. We pitched our neighbors. We talked to the media. 
And we also got people out to testify at public hearings. There were stories in the local press about how there was more anti than pro feedback, and that's why we needed the last partner in this, the city council. Now, in 2017, organizing elected a progressive city council one year before the final Minneapolis 2040 vote. The council had two years of discussion and nine months of conversation with constituents after seeing the stories from Mapping Prejudice, reading Wedge Live, and they do read Wedge Live, after joining Neighbors Former Neighbors on Walk It Talks, they understood why it was important to support this big, not perfect, but way better than the status quo plan. After just a year behind that big council dais, they knew that people opposing things show up and people supporting them don't. Yet with this plan, we showed up in support. They needed and saw community support. In the end, they voted 12 to 1 to pass Minneapolis 2040. Now, it wasn't easy and we're not done. Neighbors from Our Neighbors is focused on holding the city accountable to implementing those zoning reforms, and we're supporting others in tracking progress on affordable housing and tenants' rights. Those ordinances are now passing. I challenge each of you to identify where you fit into addressing your region's housing shortage. We need to build affordable homes at every level so people who can afford more expensive homes aren't crowding lower wealth people out of communities. And you do too. If you want to see policy changes like we're passing in Minneapolis, you need to learn your own city's hidden history. You need to talk to your neighbors. You need to show up and tell your elected leaders that you want something different. I challenge you to give us in Minneapolis something even bigger to meet. Thank you very much, Tiana, this, um, for um, telling the story in Minneapolis. Um, definitely a lot to think about and, and process. And I think for, for me, the, the thing that stands out was um, you mentioned at the beginning, um, making the, the invisible visible. And I think that applied to a couple of different things. On the one hand, it was, you know, um, really diving into the um, racist history of community development in Minneapolis. The other side of it was, you know, also making it known that there are people who are in support of, of, of what it is that you were trying to do um, that had the uh, political will and the passion and the belief in the importance of it to, to you know, you know, uh, uh, rally behind it and put um, and um, in support of it. Um, and also like how the other another 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 way you can think about this, making the invisible visible is the personal stories of people who are going through um, different situations around housing. I mean, just the fact that um, you know, the woman who, with the young child who basically like skipped <laughs> a pretty important part in, in, in her uh, development, you know, because of the housing conditions, that's really, you know, tough to hear, but that is the, the, the unfortunate reality that a lot of people are, are facing. So I'd like to ask you a question that I had asked George, um, you know, in, in, in engaging in this process, um, you know, whether it's specifically 20, uh, Minneapolis 2040 or, you know, the, you know, the years before that, um, was there anything that you learned that you were not expecting, right? And in covering these things and making the invisible visible, were there some things that you you learned, you and your team, you learned that you witnessed that, you know, it's like, oh, we, we didn't see this coming, but it was so important to make, taking the next steps in that process. Well, I was really surprised about the passion in the city on, on in all sorts of different ways. Um, I've been working on um, ensuring everybody had access to a home for 20 years in a variety of different ways. And it's always a sort of low level drumbeat that people care about, but it's not usually something people are showing up for. And it was so heartening and exciting and wonderful to, to have literally hundreds of people showing up with me alongside me in new ways, saying, I'm housing secure, but I wanna make sure everybody in my city has a safe place to go home to. I wanna make sure that we are addressing these, uh, these disparities that we have created and maybe don't get to see every day because it's a different neighborhood far from where I live or those kids don't go to school with my kids because we have segregated our city. 
Um, and I want to make sure that we're living up to our city's values. So I think that for me was the biggest surprise was just how many people really wanted to do something to create the city that they like to think they live in and are realizing that they don't quite live in yet. Yeah. That's, that's, you know, well said, you know, well said. I mean, that, that making the invisible visible, I think it creates awareness and that awareness then leads to opportunities for people to then be involved and say, oh, this is what's going on. This is not okay. You know, how can I be part of this? So that's, you know, awesome. Um, I do want to, uh, uh, you know, bring in a, a few questions from our audience. So the first is, has there been a noticeable impact on housing affordability in Minneapolis since these changes have gone into place? Are you seeing some trends in the few short years that this has been a thing? Um, I, we are seeing some shifts in housing accessibility in Minneapolis. Um, I want to put it in context. We have spent 50 years building our housing shortage. And it's going to take us a long time to catch up and have enough homes because the way we build our communities takes many, many years. Um, legalizing a triplex on a particular lot in the city doesn't mean anything happens tomorrow. Um, my neighbor across the alley lives in a single family home on a, a piece of land that is legal to have a triplex and he likes it there. He doesn't want to move. He's not going to sell his house. He's not going to tear his house down. He's not going to change it. And he's, they're a pretty young family. I don't think they're likely to go anywhere for a long time, right? So when you, when you do that across a whole city, it takes a long time to see the changes that you want to see. That's why this is a 20 year plan. Um, another thing that's important to remember is this comprehensive plan was passed in December of 2018. Uh, that was the political passage. The formal official passage was in 2019. So it has been officially in place for less than a year. Um, the zoning change that legalized triplexes on any lot in the city uh, was passed earlier this year. So the changes themselves are pretty new. Um, and we have seen a lot of housing being built in other parts of the city. And we are seeing things that are coming through the pipeline now. So um, I, I offer that all up to say, we have been working on this issue for many years. This is another piece of a host of dozens of different changes that need to happen. We are starting to see people building triplexes now in places they weren't building them before. Um, and having built many thousands of homes every year for uh, the last mm, about eight years, somewhere in the range of three to 6,000 homes a year, Minneapolis rents are dropping. So rents in May of 2020 for two bedroom apartments were 13% lower than they were in 2019. And um, the only reason we can come up with is that it's about building that new, that new housing. Some people have said maybe it's COVID. Well, we happen to have the same data for the city of St. Paul. And the city of St. Paul is actually about 10 feet away from the city of Minneapolis. So, uh, so it's the exact same region. Their rents aren't showing that kind of a drop. They haven't built those homes. And so we both experienced the same pandemic effect but we're not seeing the same shift in our housing affordability. And the only difference that there is between those two cities is how many homes we're building. So we are seeing a change. It has taken years of building to get there though, right? We, we built up this shortage over decades. Our population has grown by almost 50,000 people in the last 20 years. That's a lot of people who need homes and who have been trying to push into the same number of homes we had before. So we had a lot of catching up to do. So it's only quite recently after building, I think it's 20 plus thousand homes that we're starting to see that sort of shift and we're starting to catch up with our deficit. Thank you very much. Um, so here's another question. Uh, how did Minneapolis um, and the region assess um, build out and the impact of increased population? And so you mentioned that there was already a shortage. The population increased by 50,000 and so that you know creates a pretty tough situation but now that you're in a position where you have the zoning law in effect where now you can build more housing um how how might that affect the uh build out long term or the, just the capacity of of minneapolis and and was this kind of like analysis um incorporated um in your plans so 
So the, there's a question about capacity, and I'm not sure which capacity. So I'm going to pretend that it's about infrastructure capacity or transportation capacity or school capacity, something in that, that zone. All, all of the above, I would imagine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think it's important to name that Minneapolis used to have 70,000 more people than it does today. So Minneapolis used to have 500,000 people in it. Um, we had as few as 370,000 people in it for a couple of decades. Now we're around 420, 430. We're not exactly sure. We'll find out soon with the census. Um, so our infrastructure was built to accommodate many, many more people than live here today. Now, it's also true that we live differently when we had a population of half a million than we do today. Um, and that's a really important thing to, to, to honor. Um, and so we are changing our transportation capacity, in particular in prioritizing bus only lanes and building out a high frequency bus network that is more reliable and more frequent um, and serving those. Um, we think of them as sort of core urban neighborhoods. Um, I will say that the core urban neighborhoods in Minneapolis uh, would probably include Brookline in a, in a Boston region comparison. Our city is massive in, in terms of square miles. Um, so it's quite a large area. Uh, so that's one piece. Um, we have really old uh, stormwater and sewer infrastructure. It's not as old as in the Boston region, but it is 120, 130 years old in many places and needs replacement. So it's something that we're thinking about as we're redoing that. For our stormwater, we're shifting how we handle stormwater and capturing more of it on site because with climate change, our storms are getting much more intense. Um, Southern Minnesota had record rainstorms overnight with 10 inches falling in just a few hours. Um, and that is not, not normal. So we're recognizing we have to shift all sorts of things. Um, but mostly we're, we're putting things back where we tore things down. So a lot of the new homes are going on surface parking lots that used to ha house apartment buildings, or they used to house uh, industrial infrastructure that is, is no longer relevant. Same thing is true with our schools. Again, our school system was designed for many tens of thousands more kids than we have right now. So um, part of it is figuring out how do we make sure that people are using the capacity that we have and that we're smart about that. Yeah, great. No, I mean, that's a, <clears throat> a good, a, um, I think a good response. I mean, you mentioned that, you know, Minneapolis 2040 was so much more than the, the housing piece. I mean, obviously the, the housing piece um, got a lot of the uh, 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 the publicity um, once once it was passed, but there's so much more in this document. It's a comprehensive plan, right? So there's so much more in it than just housing. So while it may not go into the specifics of, of infrastructure and capacity long term, I think if folks were to uh, dive into that document a little bit more, they might see a more complete picture of the future of Minneapolis and how the different pieces relate to each other. Um, so another question, uh, did Minneapolis also change parking requirements? to accommodate um, this new multifamily housing. I'm really excited about this. I started my <laughs> advocacy career as a transportation transit advocate. Um, I have never owned a car and I'm always a little bit grumpy about being forced to pay for a place to store my car um, when I don't have anything to put in that space. Um, so the short answer is yes. And the long answer is it's got many steps to it. So I always think about how do you make change and I want to be really clear that Minneapolis 2040 is not where change started in Minneapolis. It is one of many steps. So um, we have a city council member, Lisa Bender, who was elected in 2013. Um, and one of the things that she did pretty early in her first term um, was, to, um, was to work on shifting parking minimums. And so she shepherded a policy that um, reduced parking minimums near frequent transit, high, high frequency transit. So if you had a building that had, I'm not sure if it was 49 or 50, um, units or fewer within a quarter mile of high frequency transit, I think that was defined as every 10 or 20 minute service, um, then you didn't need to have any parking for your building. Uh, if you had 50 to 100 units on that building, uh, in a high frequency transit corridor, you could have the number of parking units that you needed for that building. So you, you had to provide some parking, but it was much less. And then if you were outside of that range or larger than 100 units, you had to provide a lot more parking. 
Um, so that was something that got passed approximately in 2015. And something I really love is that soon after that, we started to see a different kind of building being built in Minneapolis. Um, and we saw two things. One is that the buildings uh, felt like they belonged in the neighborhood a little bit better. So before parking reform, the apartment buildings that were getting built, and there were quite a few, and they were really important homes for thousands of people, but they didn't feel right when you walked past them in the neighborhood. They felt like they were out of scale somehow. It's a little bit hard to say how. The newer buildings felt like they were the right size. They tended to be much shorter to walk past. Um, they still had parking for the most part, but they had a lot less parking. They tended to have a parking ratio of, I don't know, one half of parking, one half parking space per apartment, something like that. The other thing that we saw is that their rents were much lower. They started having rents on studio apartments that were below $1,000, something that we hadn't seen in a new building in Minneapolis. Um, in decades. And I want to name our housing prices are different than your housing prices. Um, so <laughs> just a little bit, just a little bit. expensive things in Minneapolis <laughs> will sound very affordable to you. Our incomes are also lower, right? Everything about life here is a little bit cheaper. So having any new studio apartment under $1,000 was really remarkable. They tended to be $1,400 prior to that, give or take, depending on the building and the amenities. So that reducing of parking requirements meant that the buildings fit in the neighborhood better. They were more affordable as a rule. Um, now that didn't eliminate parking minimums. In 2040, we do say that we will eliminate parking minimums citywide. Um, and again, I want to repeat, eliminating those parking minimums didn't mean people weren't building parking. It just meant they were building less parking. Um, so we are still building parking minimums in those transit corridors and we will continue to build, I'm sorry, we are still building parking and we will continue to have parking and new developments in our city. But the people building it get to figure out how much do we really need? And then the people living there won't have to subsidize so many empty, empty parking spaces. And that was introduced into, um, uh, into the council, I think last week. So that's one of those policies many of us who understand that a single parking space can cost $50,000 to build. We are very excited to see the beginning of the process to eliminate parking minimums citywide because we know that will translate directly into more affordable homes. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate that. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it back over to Rashmi and we'll um, transition to our larger um, panel discussion. Um, uh, folks, can please continue to submit your questions to us. Um, we'll make sure to, 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 to touch on the different um, things that you guys are, are curious to learn more about um, um, during the next part of this uh, conversation. Great, thank you so much, Wendell. And thank you so much to, to George and Yana as well. Uh, the, this is, this conversation has opened up so uh, so many topics for discussion, and I, I'd like to um, invite Wendell actually to join the conversation uh, now in perhaps providing a little bit of a bridge to helping um, those of us who are in Brookline think about ways to translate the many lessons that um, our, our two speakers have raised um, into action actionable items here to fulfill Yana's challenge to us, uh, for one thing. Um, so we have a number of questions already, and it's interesting as I'm looking at the questions to see that uh, people are ready to start doing the work, and the nature of the questions really suggests that. Uh, I have a number of questions too, and I'm really going to hold back from exercising the moderator's uh, privilege here and save my questions until later so that we can address some of the more specific questions that we've raised. So if you all are ready to go, uh, I'm going to start sharing questions from the from the audience here, and then uh, and then perhaps finish with a number of broader uh, closing questions for us. So the first question that I want to that I want to pose to you, um, in some ways, continues the discussion that that uh, that Yana and Wendell were just having about different constituencies and and things that they might care about. So the question is, how did landlords and developers and large corporations play a part in the discussions that you were each engaged in in each of your cities, what were the challenges that you faced, if any, in getting them you know, on board and connected with your vision? And then again, Wendell, I'm gonna invite you to, to step in and, and share some of your experiences to the extent they're relevant with respect to these constituencies as well. So, 
I don't know which of you would like to go first, but I'm not going to cold call on you, even though I am a law professor. George? Um, sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to give it a shot. Um, so throughout our planning efforts, we have had landlords, we've got particularly small local owner, property owners who live in the community have been a part of the conversation. Um, certainly when we've done projects like include increasing affordability, uh, sometimes uh, more organized groups of landlords come out to, to speak. Um, property owners, it's interesting, some of the out of town property owners um, particularly ones who own some of our industrial sites and our um, and, and our vacant parking lots, they typically don't engage with us. Um, I I can't say I go out of my way to engage them, but at the same time, if 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 they choose to be involved, you know, we we, we welcome them as participants. Um, some of the larger businesses and larger property owners engage through the Chamber of Commerce. That's been an active organization in in, in the city of Somerville. Um, and they have a full-time director and, and uh, they have a legislative committee that I often go present to. I probably presented our zoning overhaul draft information to the chamber's legislative groups seven or eight times over the course of the last couple of years as we were pulling the last pieces of zoning together. Um, so, you know, they engage as stakeholders, as, as, as equal stakeholders in a process where there's lots of other interests. I think the key is with uh, Active Community Development Corporation, they also look to pull in the voices of renters and lower income residents so that there's more balance. And then in a circumstance where you typically have larger property owners and, um, and, and uh, owner occupants sort of dominating a conversation in those strategies. So as a whole, I think that whole group comes together, um, you know, a, a, a productive and good zoning reform pro process or master planning process isn't going to necessarily make everybody happy. Um, and, and I have to say that, you know, two groups that sometimes end up unhappy when you're doing a more equitable process are um, the people who are sitting on developable land and not flipping it for development. Uh, you know, I'm sitting on a vacant parking lot. You just placed a bunch of fees on new development and now that, that the people are offering me less money to buy my land because you're requiring 20 percent affordable housing i can't feel a whole lot of sympathy there you bought that lot for twenty thousand dollars in 1964 you're going to do okay it's worth 40 million dollars it's going to be all right those sort of things you know uh and the other group that you know just not to pick too much on them that sometimes become unhappy is if you build really clear zoning that everybody can understand um, the developer attorneys who've been making money for years interpreting your old code are going to get a little frustrated because um, they have built a lot of their capacity on understanding a document that no one else understands. Um, but again, you can't make everybody happy. And if you're moving towards a more equitable outcome, that's probably going to be one of the things that's going to happen. Yeah. So I will say I was a little surprised in Minneapolis that none of those constituencies really engaged in, in any way. Um, the people who showed up were maybe unsurprisingly disproportionately white, disproportionately educated folks. There were a lot more younger people in renters than there typically are. Um, and there were a heck of a lot of older homeowners who have maybe a paid off mortgage or a, a fixed rate mortgage at uh, for a purchase price that made sense 20 years ago, but would be three or four or five times higher today, um, and who are maybe insulated from what housing costs today, that was mostly who showed up. There were also a few small advocacy groups. So um, the Sierra Club and SEIU, uh, in particular the healthcare um, um, union, uh, the, the bicycle, bike walk advocate, advocacy organization, um, the alliance uh, that used to be the Alliance for Metropolitan Stability showed up um, and in different ways. But mostly I was really surprised. Affordable housing developers have to meet the same zoning code as everybody else. And getting through a zoning approvals process is very, very difficult, especially for an affordable housing developer um, where there's often a lot of pushback. Um, and they didn't really participate in the process. 
nor did downtown businesses in any visible way. I don't know what was happening behind the scenes. They happened to have a really close connection to City Hall. Um, and and uh, property owners, landlords didn't really show up unless you count people like me. I happen to own or occupy a fourplex. That's how I afford to live in the neighborhood that, that I really love living in. I couldn't afford this if I didn't have help paying my mortgage. Um, so if I count, then I showed up. But I think I'm a little bit atypical in that. Wendell, did you have anything you'd like to add at this point? Uh, just, just briefly, I mean, I think um, George mentioned this is, is, I mean, we can't, we can't necessarily please everyone. That's, you know, goes without saying, but I think it's important to, uh, to, you know, really understand that. And I think um, people are uh, different constituents or stakeholders going to engage in, you know, these planning processes uh, in different ways, depending on their interests. Um, and I, I think for me, what's important is the, uh, the transparency, uh, the, um, and the attention behind what you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it. Um, so, you know, at the end of a process, you might not have uh, a consensus, so to speak. Um, not everybody may, you know, like or be uh, totally on board with the outcome. But I think what's perhaps more important is that everybody understands the why um, and we're part of that conversation. Um, that, again, that, that transparency and our intention um, is, is, is pretty important. And I think beyond just like the here and now of what we were trying to do, it also can build up over time. Um, you know, I think planning is so much more than just a specific, um, you know, comprehensive plan or zoning change, you know, in, you know, a three to five year time frame. but it's also, a, a, you know, we're playing the long game as well, thinking about the long-term development of our communities and the, <clears throat> the opportunity with these specific processes is the um, possibility of developing an infrastructure where dialogue can, can take place between and within the community and the different constituents uh, involved. Um, so I think that is also something to keep in mind is that there are parallel efforts here. There's what we're trying to do here and now, but there's also building a muscle for dialogue and for um, um, an exchange of ideas um, over a longer period of time. Yeah, I'm actually going to, I am going to exercise the moderator's privilege to follow up on this piece. And um, as each of you was speaking, and now also Wendell, um, I was thinking about the extraordinary importance of a, of a community process, an inclusive community process that each of you emphasized. And I'm wondering if if you could turn it into, you know, a, a slogan or two that you would share with us. What, what would you describe as best practices for just pulling together that kind of process um, for, for a community that is maybe viewing itself as just embarking um, on the path of doing that? Well, I mean, I, th I think one thing I would say is one slogan I would point out is that if if you just hold an hold an event as a community as part of a community process and you look around at the group of people in the room, um, the one thing I can guarantee you is is you don't have all the right people in the room. Um, and one of the things we've actually started doing with each of our neighborhood planning efforts is pull together a diverse group of people in what we call our crowdsourcing session and spend mm -hmm. the first meeting just talking about who's not in the room and how we get them in the room before we actually do any planning work because um, a lot of our problems occur with uh, the this, this circumstance whereby the people in the room make the decision and then you go out and share it with everybody else and, and you know, you find you've left out renters, you've left out people of color, you've left out huge portions of the constituency that is represented in your community. Design process to counteract historic power imbalances. So in Minneapolis, the, the planners started by saying, we know who is missing. And so they waited to engage the people who usually show up, the people who, George, I think you're talking about being in that room, until after they had framed up the plan with those folks who mostly aren't comfortable, safe, invited, welcome in those rooms. Um, and they did incredible work to make safer spaces, predictable spaces. Um, 
and to honor the input from those folks before they engaged wealthier, whiter homeowners and people like me. Um, and I think that that is absolutely critical. If you don't acknowledge power imbalances when you're designing engagement and design to counteract what you know is going to happen, what has always happened in every community in the United States, you're gonna get the same result and you're not going to be able to overcome the continuing imbalance in political influence in local processes. One of the things we have gotten better at doing in Somerville is engaging people in their native language if their native language isn't English. It's one thing to have a person present a plan in English and have someone sit and translate to them. It's an even better thing to have somebody go present to a person in Brazilian Portuguese who is Brazilian, a Brazilian immigrant. Um, we did that with our business community in Union Square. Um, it turned out a lot of what we got for feedback was complaints about parking, which is what I get from my English speaking business owners. But nonetheless, you know, you learn more about things when you engage with more people um, and find and find more ways to do it. Thank you. All right, let's turn to let's turn to issues that maybe were more contentious. So I have a couple of questions here. One actually specifically for Yana, uh, but then one that I think is 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 generalizable and 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 would be ideal if each of you could address. So I'll share them both now, and that will give George a little extra time to think and, and Yana less time because perhaps you'll be answering the, the one specifically for you. Um, so the one for you, Yana, is is by someone who says, I just finished reading Golden Gates about the efforts for more housing in California, which has featured serious conflicts between YIMBY advocates and tenant and low income advocates. Has Minneapolis has had similar conflicts and if so, how have you addressed them? How have you overcome them? And then the question for both of you is just um, to asking you to reflect about what issues you would describe or details of the comprehensive plans um, that were particularly contentious uh, and what you did in, in, in reaction or in response to those contentious issues. So let's see, California is a special place um, and the conflicts that are there are especially, um, especially strong. Uh, I will say that I, there are very few places where some of those same patterns about um, protecting tenants' rights and concerns about new housing pushing people out um, don't flare up. And they appear in Minneapolis as well. Um, and one of the things that, like, we haven't solved it. We're continuing to reach out and engage. And one of the things that Neighbors More Neighbors does very intentionally is to uh, amplify uh, messages from tenants' rights organizations. So uh, when Incolinos Unidos por Justicia is doing a protest, we always make sure to share that with folks because Tenants' rights are absolutely critical. Having enough homes to go around is necessary and it is not sufficient for ensuring that everybody has access to a home that is affordable in the neighborhood they choose. Um, we also need to protect tenants. So that's one thing that we do. Um, uh, when there are calls for fundraising, we again amplify those and, and when we are able, as we are able, we pitch in to support other organizations. Um, when there are calls for more affordable housing funding, we absolutely amplify those and also have our members send out those messages. So um, we're working to build those bridges and uh, it's not always great, right? It's kind of a struggle. And um, we think it's critical to recognize that we all have slightly different areas of focus and that's okay. One thing that we've done that's been kind of contentious. So. Um, I will say I do not identify as a YIMBY. I saw a YIMBY question in there somewhere. And, and so I identify as a, a pro-homes uh, access to, to housing as a human right advocate who has worked enough in housing to know if we don't have enough homes to go around, we can't do anything else. Um, so one thing that Neighbors for My Neighbors has done that has been a little bit contentious within Neighbors for My Neighbors community is to say, if there is a historically disinvested red line neighborhood where there's a proposal for a building um, and the folks who live in that community don't want that building, we will not show up for that building. So um, 
There are some folks in Neighbors for More Neighbors who really struggle with that because we have an absolute housing shortage and that helps address that housing shortage. We also have an absolute challenge of people are being displaced from their communities. And we want to honor, you know, those folks have not had the opportunity to shape their neighborhoods for the last 80 years. Wealthy white folks who live in neighborhoods like mine have imposed our exclusion and forced any growth that wanted to happen into their neighborhoods because we had more political power. And so it is my position and Neighbors for Neighbors is generally on board with this that we're gonna stand up and make sure that those neighborhoods have the right to self-determination and to instead focus on ending exclusion because concentrations of affluence are the cause of concentrations uh, of race and poverty. And we want people to be able to choose where they wanna live. And until we end those exclusionary policies that create concentrations of affluence, people don't have choices. So we are focusing on those concentrations of affluence. Um, we're still struggling, I'll say that. George, did you wanna to respond to the broader question about con contentious issues? There, there are two contentious issues I, I want to address. They come up in comprehensive planning, in neighborhood planning, in individual project reviews, um, and they, they peacefully coexist with each other in some odd way that, that causes us all sorts of challenges. And one is building height and the other is open space. And one of the mistakes, I'll call it a mistake, others will disagree vehemently with me, uh, that we made in the summer vision plan in 2030 um, was the only number that was changed from the staff's initial recommendation on what those numbers should be in terms of growth uh, was the open space number. And we added a lot more acres of open space to our open space goal above and beyond uh, what the staff had originally recommended. And we have actually found, and I mean, we've now done the numbers and dug deeper into it, that that somewhat last minute change done in response to community uh, requests um, is almost impossible to fit within the land area of our community and make it work. Um, so we have a lot of advocacy when people do development projects to push for more open space to say, uh, particularly as we do our bigger, more transformational developments, um, the, the area is more like assembly square where you're, where you're building higher, bigger, higher density, new neighborhood type stuff. They say put more open space in, but the challenge is to achieve our housing goals and get more open space, the only place you can go is up. And so then the question starts coming up about building height. And so now the people coming out who, oh, this is gonna block my skyline view of the city of Boston from the hill I've lived on for 20 years, those people come out with their issues about building height. Um, I have other concerns, challenges about building height. I, I, I will say that even in the, in the corridors, the smaller buildings that I was showing, the three, four, five story buildings in the corridors, inevitably, Time and again, the greatest challenges we have in our community are not the 500 unit housing developments in Assembly Square. They are the four story building on the corridor and the one two family house that sits directly behind it whose view is gonna be affected by that building. And I think we just have to get past that if we're ever going to get to the point where we're going to be able to provide the type of housing that we need in the place that's immediately adjacent to our transit stations. Like that's just, that's the only way to do it and those areas are challenging. So there's controversy at that at the comprehensive plan level, there's controversy at the neighborhood plan level, there's controversy at the development level around those two issues and they're constant. I want to create good quality open spaces. In a very dense city that is challenging to do and that is important to do. At the same time, when you're putting $2 billion of transit infrastructure into a community and providing them very short commutes into the inner core where our greatest job opportunities are. I can't fill all the remaining space with open spaces and not consider the fact that we're in a place that's very desirable for people to want to live to get access to those jobs. So you have to figure out how to balance those things. And all I can say is a substantial amount of planning and conversation is necessary to figure out how to make that balance work. I am not going to be able to solve our regional, national, and international need for reforestation and all of these other issues in the inner core three miles from downtown Boston. I need to so focus more on housing needs there and figure out how to create quality open spaces for the people who are going to live there, while at the same time acknowledging that doing so is also addressing an issue where a lot of people 
in the region are choosing more sprawled out further away, longer commute places to live because we're not offering as much housing in the inner core as we should be. So balancing all of those needs and pieces becomes very complicated. And that is a place where we see a lot of the challenging countries. May I add one more thought? Um, so when there are contentious issues, it's often on something very specific. And, and so George, you just named open space and, and height. Um, we work really hard when there is something that seems contentious to focus on our values. Right? So we care about open space because we want to live in neighborhoods that are great places to live. And we want our neighbors to have a, access to the same kind of quality of life that we all want. Um, and so we always go back to, this is critical to make sure people have a place to live, right? And focus on, it's not a question about open space or no open space. It's not a question about three stories or five stories. This is a question about three stories and more people living in tents in our parks or five stories and people having access to homes because those, those are the actual choices that we are facing in our communities. And when we let ourselves get drawn into this question about, well, how many parking spaces is it? And will I be able to park on the street in front of my house? We are saying implicitly, it's more important for people, for cars to have a stable home than it is for people to have a stable home. So we always try to pull it back to our core values and recognize that these aren't abstract trade-offs about whatever the specific issue is that somebody names, that we need to think about how do we solve this problem as a whole and make sure that every single person in Minneapolis has a stable, safe home in the neighborhood they choose. And, and Wendell, I'd love for you to uh, to ruminate, reflect on this a little bit, if you could, um, from the from your work closer to to the home we're all dialing in mostly from uh, on the on the subject of contentious issues and 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 if you have more to add on the open space question that was actually a question that was raised that George preempted in part uh, but if, if you if you could take an opportunity to reflect on that in our area that would be wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think George really um, illustrated the um, the difficult task of trying to balance a wide range of needs in the short of my, in a, in a in a relatively small area that is more or less built out, right? So the opportunities to do um, that kind of work are limited, and I mean, yeah, it's it, there's a very hard task of of you know what what is you know while these are, are, are priorities, what might be the most appropriate right now um, in terms of addressing some of the more pressing needs? I think if you take a step back and look at the range of needs in a given city, um, they're all important. I think some may present to be a little bit more pressing than others based on a variety of factors, which could be you know, the number of people that are impacted by it, the degree to which they're impacted by it, um, the time factors is always important, um, all that kind of stuff. And it's it's this is the difficult work that planners um, have to do, and um, well, not just planets, right? But I mean, we're we're you know knee deep in it. Um, I think you know going back to contentious issues. I mean, I, to this is kind of like a, a also follow up of an earlier question. Um, how we have conversations in our communities about these issues matters. Um, we touched on rooms, right? This idea of of not everybody is always in a particular room at a given point in time, and we try to look for creative ways to. Um, you know, create more rooms for people to um, um, that for people to you know enter to feel welcomed in and to you know be part of the conversation. The room is one piece of it. I think the other piece is also how people express themselves. Um, I think it's important to understand, like to the degree that you know uh, communities are are diverse um, and you know uh, feature a diverse range of people. People express themselves in different ways, and I am very interested in planning processes that not only create multiple rooms for people to express themselves in, but um, that also accommodate multiple forms of expression um, and have that be part of the conversation as well. So, you know, what does that mean? Well, for some folks, some folks feel very, very, very comfortable to attend a planning board meeting and to stand up 
and to say, this is who I am, this is my dress, and this is what I think about this. And that's that's fine for them. Not everybody is gonna move in the same way. Um, and, and for a variety of reasons, one can just be, um, you know, how comfortable they are standing in front of a room talking to strangers. One can just be, well, now people know where I live. It could be a personality thing, it could be English proficiency, et cetera, et cetera. So how can we accommodate different ways in which people uh, feel comfortable expressing themselves aside from the traditional, as George mentioned earlier, um, you know, the, the the old way of doing things where, you know, um, you know, you, you stand up and you say your piece and you, and you sit back down. And so I think, I think planning processes or planners would do well to think about that in a very creative way. The arts can be one way of doing that, right? Um, think about how can we integrate the arts into planning processes and have that be an avenue where people are a lot more comfortable or um, feel a bit more agency in, in terms of just saying exactly what they want to say and the way that they want to say it and know that, you know, it's being taken seriously and it's part of the conversation um, and we're not necessarily, you know, uh, choosing to value some forms of expression that some people choose to, to, to engage in more than others. So, yeah, I mean, th the room is one piece and then the way that people engage and express is another. Um, and I think we have to really be intentional and creative and, um, you know, uh, uh, forward thinking in terms of how we try to get that. We've received more questions than we're going to be able to address. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to um, ask the following question, really as a follow up to uh, the comments that that Wendell just shared. But again, open it to all of you, and then and then I don't know if I have the right to do this, but I'm going to ask you to consider um, being available to respond to the one or, or two additional questions that we received, but that I can't um, pose to you right now within our time frame. Uh, so that perhaps by email, so that we can then post it on our website afterwards. Um, but here's the question that I want to ask by way of follow up, and it's from someone who has read Ibram Kendi's um, How to Be an Anti-Racist and um, talks about how the author points to self-interest as the obstacle to eliminating policy that maintains exclusion. So just really following up exactly on Wendell's comments, uh, the person the question the person poses is, is, I think, so apt. Would you recommend considering a self-shaming strategy? How's that for a final question to keep you thinking even after the panel ends? Wendell, do you want to get us started? Yeah, I think yeah, you're still yeah, on yeah. Well, I, I, I'm oh, Wendell, go, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Okay, Wendell um, first and then George. It, it, okay. All right. Um, I think it's a very interesting strategy. Um, I think it has its, I think it has a role to play. Um, my, my, my brother is, uh, I, I love quoting him on this, but he, he always likes to say that shame is an, an underrated social tool, right? <laughs> which, which is true. Um, but the, 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 the back, the, the second part to that is it's hard to, you can't shame somebody or who does not have any shame, right? So the, the, the self, the self shaming strategy, um, has a role to play. It only takes you so far because some people are actually quite resolute and quite comfortable in their, um, exclusive, you know, position on, you know, their communities and their neighborhoods and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think. So, so I think the, 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 the hard work is in just wrestling with these questions and these issues for oneself. Um, I think we all have a journey to take to understand what role we play in a larger uh, narrative or a larger effort around equity and justice and, and in, in eliminating you know, exclusive um, housing policies or just discrimination, racism in the built environment in general. Like everybody has a role to play um, professionally and personally. I mean, as a planner, I have to think about the role that I play in either furthering um, you know, these exclusive values or trying to peel it back and reduce the harm that it, that it causes on, on, on communities. But I also have a personal journey to take as well to feel, you know, how do I as a human being engage in these questions and these issues. And so, um, I think I think it is a very. I mean, that that is the question. I think for me, I think planning is a question, especially given the history of planning, the history of this country. Yes, but also the history of planning in 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 um, um, 
creating um, the uh, situations that we have in so many cities and communities across the country, it, it, this is the question that I think we all have to ask ourselves as, as practitioners is, how do I reduce harm and actually be of service to people and communities in a way that uplifts and dignifies human beings and their needs? Um, so I don't, I didn't intentionally mean to respond to your question with a question, but that is the question. <laughs> uh, this is a very difficult place for a public sector mid-level manager employee to find themselves. I guess it's tough to say. Uh, you know, uh, to the extent that there is self-shaming, um, I, I do my share of shaming of some of the historic decisions that have been made in Somerville that have led us to some of the things we had to change. But even that is difficult to do. People in our community have very long memories. When you talk about some of the things in the old zoning code that were frustrating, um, you know, you will often hear me remind people that it was the best practice of its time, um, that our, our 1990 zoning code was state of the art for 1990. It totally does not work. It didn't work in 2010. It worked even less in 2019 when it was replaced. Um, uh, shaming the creators of that, the defenders of that, the people who are, it's it just, I mean, the short answer to it is it's a very difficult place to put a mid-level manager, public sector employee. That said, I think there is a role for that strategy in the greater, in the greater struggle. I guess I'll just leave it at that for this moment. Thank you. And Yana, uh, you're still on mute, Yana. As an advocate, I have a little bit more flexibility. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think about what will create the change that reduces harm the most. Um, so I'm a I'm a pragmatic person because every day we don't build more homes. There are people who are pushed out of their homes and onto the streets. So, and so what I wanna center is always those folks and think about what is the strategy that gets the most people home stability the fastest and keeps us headed in the right direction. Um, and man, white fragility is a really powerful thing. So figuring out the right way to dance around political power of people who are maybe feeling shame and not yet able to admit that publicly, or who are really wrestling with things that are new to them, when you're also needing to center that there are people who for hundreds and hundreds of years, they and their ancestors have been pushed to the side and pushed out, that's a really difficult thing. So, you know, what we did in Minneapolis worked for us in the context we found ourselves in in 2018. And we worked hard to not point at individuals or to shame individuals, but to let people notice their discomfort, notice that they might be in a bubble that was shameful for the city as a whole, that map that shows where those red signs are and how that's not representative of the city. Some people were really angry about that map and felt personally attacked by that. Um, many other people said, I didn't realize that that was what was going on and started to show up. It, it gave them the freedom to show up. So we use that to help people notice things. And then we gave them an outlet to be who they like to think that they are and fight for a different future. That worked for us. But the political context is different in every city and every year. And I really hope that two years from now and five years from now, we don't have to ask this question about self-shaming. So thank you so much. We are um, basically completely out of time. It's hot outside, but that may not be enough to stop people from wanting to go out, uh, at least in, in, in our part of the country. So um, the, the organizers asked me to give a few moments of 
summary, a reflection of, uh, of, the, of what's transpired here, which obviously is a little bit impossible because the, of the richness of the conversation. But I am going to just throw out a little bit of a wordle, if you will, of an, 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 not a written wordle, but a, but a, but a spoken wordle. Um, uh, by way of themes that have come up, I'm going to take one and a half minutes to do this because um, the themes that I think particularly that, uh, that you all have emphasized are the perfect segue into what the organizers are planning for Forum 3. And the plan is to have the third forum in this series um, in the mid-fall. Uh, the exact date has not yet been determined, but the idea is to continue to explore what we've learned exactly from these two cases, uh, Som Somerville and Minneapolis, um, but also from you know, our experiences and our, our, our information from around the country to really identify things that have been happening uh, or uh, that ought to happen and can be adapted to, to Brookline's needs um, and efforts in developing housing affordability here. So the, 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 the piece, the themes that I would most emphasize in anticipation of that next conversation are um, the, the, uh, the articulation of the range of groups, which almost we could have taken verbatim from both Yana and George in developing a highly inclusive process. The value of transparency in that process, um, of the sharing of a, of a history in particular of, of racism and of using that history as a way of being explicit about the goals uh, that were important to the particular community in developing um, housing affordability, but also addressing the other intertwined goals and needs that were felt by that community. So that George's articulation of the group, the, the neighbors um, efforts to increase, increase uh, have an explicit discussion of equity uh, and, and Yana's a description of the ways in which neighbors became involved um, right from the beginning and then continued in holding the city's the city accountable were such powerful examples of that. Um, and then the importance of incorporating all of those groups in an active process of visioning uh, seemed so relevant here. And finally, two other pieces uh, really rose to the to the to the to the surface for me in these conversations. One is just the, the idea of neighbors as the units of action, right? That people are involved in these processes and think of themselves as neighbors in the process. And then the second is the articulation of goals and values through the process of changing the zoning for the particular area. Uh, so I'll leave, uh, I'll, I'll leave the discussion of themes at that, but just, um, hope that those ideas, uh, those themes that, that have been raised by our speakers can inspire us as we move forward. Uh, and then I'll say that the very next step in Forum 3 is a visioning process. So we hope that, uh, you know, that those of you who have been here today can join us again uh, in the third forum. Uh, certainly the for forum organizers understand that it's going to take more beyond visioning, um, that we'll need to work on a multi-pronged strategy, that we'll need to identify resources to continue our work moving forward. But at least in that next step of our process together, the hope is to come together, uh, uh, use Zoom technology uh, to break up into chat rooms and really roll up our sleeves and talk about how to bridge that gap um, from our, between our progressive values and, uh, and still the, the impact perfect reality that at least in Brookline we continue to experience. So with that, thank you so much for your attendance. Uh, thank you to the, to the panelists and to our moderator, Wendell, for their participation. Stay tuned and have a good afternoon.